Jean-François Mazzoni, welcome to the executive talk. Uh, it is called the executive talk because we're talking about executives and uh, you're probably one of the biggest experts uh, in that field worldwide. So uh, you're the right person to ask, what makes a good executive, a good leader? Um, how many hours do we have? <laughs> no, uh, look, um, I, I don't know that there is a, a very simple uh, three bullet point answer to this. I think that the role of executives is, is, is uh, multifaceted. I think also which executive, are we talking about the CEO or are we talking about a, a, a member of an executive team? Um, but as a general rule, as a general rule, I would say uh, three fundamental roles. One, you've got to think about the, the, the strategic field, where do you play, how do you win? Mm -hmm. um, the overview, in a way. Yeah, the competitive dimension. I yeah. mean, it, and, and that's true even if you're a not-for-profit, right? In a not-for-profit, there will always be some form of stakeholder, some form of funding agency, some form of recipient. So, so there's, you know, regardless of what you do, there is an issue of strategy. Uh, and that strategy really is, is going to be around uh, where do we play and how do we win. Uh, then there's going to be a role as an organizational architect because, again, when you're a, a leader and, and you have three or four or five or seven people working for you, it's one thing. But then one day, typically in large organizations, you end up managing managers and then you end up talking to somebody who talks to somebody who talks to somebody who does something. There are thousands so, of people well, in so, there, right? so you need to design an organization, processes, structure, mm -hmm. systems, uh, rewards, technology, information flows. So, so I call this organizational architect. Uh, and then you need to mobilize. And again, you're going to mobilize your own team, the rest of the organization. You're going to mobilize your board. You're going to mobilize external constituencies, the press, um, the unions. Voilà. So, so those are the three fundamentals, if you will. There's, there's a, a role as a strategist. There's a role as an architect. And then you've got to mobilize. But again, then there's so many other things that that's, you got to get right. you are for, in a way, that, the, mm -hmm. that, that, that people can learn these things at the IMD. When we, when we see what one of your core goals is, uh, behind you we see that, we see, uh, uh, that sign. Uh, you're in for developing leaders. Can you develop leaders? Can you make a leader out of everyone? Or do, do you have to be a born leader? I mean, yes. that's probably something you get all the time. Right? Yes, no, that's a very fundamental question, and it's an excellent one. So point number one, can leadership be taught? I am not sure about that. Uh, but we don't think about our role as teaching leadership or even teaching leaders. We do use the term developing leaders because, again, I'm not sure that leadership can be taught, but I'm pretty sure it can be learned. Mm -hmm. So our job is to help leaders to reflect on their practice, uh, develop awareness, understand how they're naturally cabled, uh, understand why they're naturally cabled this way, uh, because there is such a thing as, as genetic predispositions, right? There's no, no ifs and buts about oh, really? it. Yeah. Oh, yes, there, there is, and, and there's lots of, so again, you're if you're- kind of a born leader in that way. Well, no, some of us, are, we're all born with certain predispositions, and those predispositions are going to, again, be helpful in some settings and unhelpful in others, right? So, so I have four sons. Uh, one of them is, is a natural extrovert, a very quick, very gregarious from a leadership point of view that gives him some advantages. Right? So, so when we moved a few years ago from Switzerland to Singapore, he arrived in his new school with pretty imperfect English. Within a week, he was elected on the student council because you know, he's, he's, he goes forward, he puts himself up front, he's confident, and that's an asset. Then the challenge is, can you sustain the trust that the people put in you and so on, right? So, so, and sometimes when people are overly charismatic, they have a bit of a deficit of listening, right? Whereas people who maybe are a little bit more introvert will, will, will be better listeners from a natural cabling point of view. So, so again, what we try to do is we try to help leaders understand how they were cabled, why they were cabled this way, because it's not just the initial genetic predisposition, it's also what life has taught you up until now. And then we also help them to decide is, is, am I super happy with this? Am I perfectly happy with who I am? Or are there one or two or three aspects where I feel that I could become a better version of myself? Or I am like this part of the time, 
and I would like to be like this a greater proportion of the time. So that's and like that can be learned. That's the part that can be learned. Almost an, an, an inner work that you that you do as well. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a big psychological aspect. It's not yes. just about the numbers. It's just a, not just about business. It's about how you feel, how you how you approach things. Right? Well, from an implementation point of view and from a development point of view, is in terms of the leadership and particularly the leadership behavior. Mm -hmm. People come to us. At the end of the program, often they say, that's it, I got it. I, I now know what I need to do to be a better leader. So they leave with great intentions. And then comes the implementation. The question is, you know, will you be able to sustain yeah. this interest? Will you be able to sustain this desire? Because, look, I'm sure you've made New Year resolution before. I'm sure you've been to training programs before and you said, now that's it, I got it. But it's hard to change your behavior. So from a leadership point of view, you were asking, are leaders born or made? Clearly. If you read about Nelson Mandela, he was remarkable as a child and as a young man. That, it, so, so, so there was something in him that, 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 that had predisposition. But he was not predisposed to spend 27 years in jail and to learn to forgive. So, so I think it's always a combination of nature and nurture. Yeah, I once read that uh, you said, you know, you, you, cannot, you cannot make someone without charisma into a charismatic leader like, like Nelson Mandela or uh, Barack Obama, I think you said as well. Uh, how important is charisma? How important is personality? How important is, I mean, can you, can a, can a, let's put it that way, can a dull, boring person be a good leader? Yes, absolutely. So let's be very clear. So first of all, charisma is in the eye of the beholder, point number one. Two, there are several facets to charisma. Now, when we use charisma in everyday talk, we tend to think as, uh, of charisma in terms of the more magnetic aspect of it. The Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, sort of magnetic charisma. When Bill Clinton walks into a room, when John F. Kennedy walked into a room, they own ah, voila, there's a sense that there's, 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 this, there's this magnetic aura that we cannot teach, that we, that we cannot teach. Uh, what you can develop is other facets of charisma. For example, one aspect of charisma, which is often associated, because again, charisma is, it enables you to get followers to do things they would not have otherwise done. No? So for example, Gandhi. Gandhi was not particularly a very tall person. Uh, he was not particularly a fiery speaker, but yet he got millions of people to do things that they would not have otherwise done. Why? Because of his exemplarity, uh, because of the courage that he displayed, because of the personal price he paid. So you can be an effective leader without being an amazing speaker. Now, obviously, if you are an amazing speaker, it yeah. will help. Yeah. So my response to this is charisma is neither necessary nor sufficient. Because there, has been, there have been charismatic leaders over the years that ended up being failure for themselves, for their organization, and in some cases, in even broader systems. Huh? So charisma is neither necessary nor sufficient. Some degree of charisma will help you uh, to get things done, particularly when you have a weak hand. You know, when, when your structural assets are pretty low, it kind of helps to be able to look folks and go like, hey, come on, we can do this together. So uh, again, Barack Obama, was a remarkably effective speaker. Barack Obama could get into a stadium and get 80,000 people to cry. Uh, that was an amazing asset. It got him elected. Then when he got elected, there were some things that kind of stood in the way and, and that, again, made, made him an effective leader in some aspects, but also other aspects restricted a bit his, his effectiveness. What about his successor? Is, is Donald Trump a good leader? What do you think? He's a businessman, so uh, he should be able to start. Uh, all leaders need to be hard of hearing because, again, you cannot hear all the misery of the world. You've got to be able to march. But there is a fine line between hard of hearing and deaf. There is also a fine line between I define reality, which leaders must do, and I define reality in a way which is totally disconnected from any form of objective reality, which sometimes he does. So voilà, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging situation. It's a challenging yeah. situation. Uh, also, let's be frank, uh, his previous experiences did not exactly prepare him for this job. I mean, it prepared him in, a, in some ways, but uh, managing that kind of, of large organization with, with you know, diplomacy issues and so on. So, well, uh, look, there, was a, there's a, there is a democracy. He was elected. Uh, there are then counterpowers. Uh, well, uh, the, the world is, is, doing, is doing its best in its current configuration. But from a leadership point of view, I think he exemplifies some qualities of leaders. In some cases, at such an extreme level that, that they get in the way. 
when you say there's a fine line between between uh, you know very very self confident and arrogant, uh, is that one of your challenges as well in 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 your school in in the IMD that uh, you get people who are who are already formed who already have success? Is there a is there a kind of work to do as well for you to kind of teach them? More to be more humble, or to maybe to 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 listen a little bit more to their uh, to their people. I mean, is that part of the formation as well, part of the education? Uh, yes, except I don't think we teach people to be humble, uh, or we teach people to listen. We help them realize that maybe they're not as good, or not as amazing, or not as perfect as they thought they were, which is different, right? So. Uh, as, as a personal note, when I was a child, I was asked one day by my German teacher, are you good in German? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And another teacher said to me, Manzoni, you've got to be humble. And I said, look, she asked me a question. Am I good in German? The answer is empirically, I am. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand. Except over the years, what happens is you meet people who are really, really good in German. And then you go like, ooh, actually, I'm not as good as I thought. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's the challenge for leaders. Leaders, and especially the more senior you become, the more positive feedback you receive. You know, it's, it just for me, at my own modest level, it's pretty rare that somebody stops me in the corridor to say, God, you were awful this morning. You know? Generally, people go like, wow, good speech. Did you hear yeah. that before? When you weren't a leader, when you weren't the president of the Sure, yeah. sure. And, and, and you, the, you know, the more senior you are, the less you hear it. In part, because they don't want to aggravate you. In part, sometimes also because they like you. They figure, look, you know, he's busy enough. I'm not going to add to his. So, the more senior you become, the less honest feedback you tend to get. So one of the things that, again, we help leaders understand is, is this uh, kind of positive bias to the feedback that they get. So we encourage them to seek uh, unbiased feedback. We encourage them to seek disconfirming evidence. MBA at the IMD costs more than 100,000 francs. Some people might say, this is outrageous. I mean, it, does it really have to be so expensive? We're a small independent business school. Kind of a boutique business school. And, and basically, we have to charge enough to be able to pay the facilities, uh, pay the staff and the faculty, invest in research and development, invest in things that are not going to help today uh, because nobody sees the need today, but, but will help a year, two, three years from now. We need to be sufficiently ahead of the world. Voilà. And, and, and all of this requires us to charge enough. So what I say to clients and also to executives is I say, look, my number one and number two thought is never how much am I going to charge you for this. I often say to clients, I don't need to send you an invoice every time we think of you. Okay? I also say that if we don't send enough invoices by the end of the year, there's going to be an issue because we're going to not going to be able to make the payroll. So for us, uh, again, we're not maximizing our profit. We're trying to collect, you know, to, to be able to charge enough for our activities so that we can, again, like any organization, make the payroll uh, and invest sufficiently in our physical and non-physical facilities. And uh, as you said, I mean, you have to look ahead uh, you have to keep a sustainable business, uh, and since since business schools are so linked to the world economy, uh, it it is actually it does have an effect. And you said it yourself sure. that uh, if there's a crisis, uh, that's probably the first thing that 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 companies are 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 not paying anymore for. It's, there's not going to be a, a business program, an educational program. Uh, do you often stay awake at night and really fear that moment of the next financial crisis where where you might feel it? I mean, uh, first, first thing, right? These are discretionary activities. You're right that when times are tough, discretionary activities tend to be cut. So here our response is the following. We want to be more of an aspirin and not as a vitamin. I was recently with the CEO of one of our largest corporate partner, and he was telling me, look, we're going through a tough period. I haven't absolutely given any instruction to reduce executive development, but I can't exclude the possibility that given how difficult things are, there will be a little bit less people coming to you. But I promise you, as soon as we get more money, we'll come back. And I looked at him and I said, you know, thank you very much for this, it's, it's kind of you, but I said, you know, what strikes me is you seem to think about what we do as a vitamin, you know, which is if you take it and if you take it regularly enough, it's good for you, but you know, if you skip a day or two, it's fine. I said, you could also think of us as, a, as, as, a, sorry, as an aspirin, meaning as something that helps you to uh, cure a headache. Really? And he said, well, yeah. he said, well, like what? I said, well, so right now you're, de you're deploying this enormous transformation. You're investing tens of millions or, you know, of, of their currency uh, into this particular program, and you're hoping that this will have hundreds of millions and billions in implication. 
you know very well that right now you have hundreds of managers who are not so great at leading this change process. They understand what needs to be done, but they're not very good at how. And he said, yeah, that's true. I said, we can help them to be better at how. So again, you can think of what we do as, you know, if you do enough of it, at some point, something good will happen. Or you can look at it as, we actually help executives to be more effective, not only seven years from now, but also like now. We can help people do a better job today, tomorrow, in what they do. Again, we're an independent business school, and, and we're uh, uh, abnormally close to practice, or more closer to practice than most other schools. So what we do is not just good five years or 10 years from now. Yeah. We can also help people to tackle more it's effectively. It's reflected immediately in their, yeah, in their To tackle companies. more effectively their challenges of today. So again, my board said this to me. I said, Jean-Francois, what's the plan if there's a recession? And I said, if there's a recession, the plan is to work with executives and organizations on how we help them to face the recession better. Mm -hmm. If we're a vitamin, we're in trouble. If we're an aspirin, hey, even when you have a recession, when you have a headache, you take the aspirin. Yeah. So we want to be very relevant to executives and to organizations. I can feel it doesn't keep you up at, at night. And if I, if I hear you speak, you're, you're a very... Uh, but it keeps you up during the day, i got to tell you. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure. Um, you're French, Canadian. Uh, you've, been, you've, been, you've been a professor here at the IMD. Then you went to Singapore. Uh, you worked for another business school. Yes. Uh, then you came back here. Uh, when I hear you speak, you're such, a, you're such a temperamental man. Let's put it that way. Uh, I hope have not. You ever but you mean passionate. Passionate okay. and, and with, not, not, a, not with a temper or a bad temper, but uh, someone who's really passionate about things. Yes. Uh, have you ever felt that Switzerland might be a little bit too too small, a little bit too boring for you, you knowing the world and the business world as well? Why did you come back? I came back because this is my tribe. And I had spent seven years here. They were the best seven years of my career and part of the best seven years of my life. And the search committee called and said, you know, there's a sufficiently large proportion of members of the tribe who think that you should come back and lead the tribe. It's an honor, right? It, it is. It's not always a pleasure, I got to tell you, <laughs> but, but it is every day an honor. So, so it was really a sense of, you know, the tribe is calling and says, we need you to come back and we need you to help. Voilà. So, so and, and I'm very, you know, humble and modest about the impact I can have, but it doesn't prevent me from trying really hard. So why did I come back? Because this is my tribe and because the tribe called. Why is this my tribe? Because I like what we do and I like the way we do it. We are passionate about developing leaders and transforming organizations. We are also passionate about doing this in a way that has a positive impact on society. Um, so, and, 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 and this is something which is true with all of my colleagues. It's also true with all of the staff. In, in a lot of schools, there is a divide between faculty and staff. Here, there is re I'm not saying there is zero divide, but there is really a sense of we're all in this together. We know why we are showing up in the morning. We want to make a positive difference. It's not just about let me do another program, let me send another invoice. We are genuinely passionate about this. We recruit people who are passionate about this. So, so that's why I'm here. Yeah. Switzerland is an asset for us. Switzerland is respected throughout the world. I lived, you said, five years in Singapore. Hey. Singapore presented itself as the Switzerland of the East for a long time. So, so, so Switzerland is respected, is respected for, for its rigor, for its innovation, um, for the ability of the citizens of this country to apply delayed gratification. I mean, this is a country where people are able to say, yeah, it'd be fun if we did this, but on the other hand, we will pay it later. So no, we're not going to do this. So it's respected for its education system. Uh, it's respected also for its neutrality, for its intelligence. Well, so, so Switzerland is a very powerful asset. We are proud of our Swiss roots. Um, it's on our, 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 our screensaver. Uh, voilà. Now, recently we came up with a digital ranking. The digital ranking, I think Switzerland ranked eighth. Uh, Doris Leutard very kindly mentioned the ranking. Uh, we wrote to her, we said, look, you know, can we talk about this? And so, so we went and we talked about it. Uh, we discussed with her. Uh, we're also members of Digital Switzerland, so we really try to, again, contribute. Uh, you remember I said a minute ago, Switzerland, uh, sorry, Singapore presented itself for a long time as, as the Switzerland of the East. We need to be a little bit mindful of the fact that we don't want to, a few years from now, be known as the Singapore of the West. Mm -hmm. so, so the world is moving very fast. Uh, when I 
When I came to Switzerland in 2004, coming from a neighboring country, I thought, my God, Switzerland is the best organized place in the world. Everything is so, you know, so well organized, so quick, so... I enjoyed this massively. Then I went to live in Singapore for five years, and then I came back. I got to tell you, during the five years I was in Singapore, uh, the world moved on a lot, mm -hmm. huh? and and where and Switzerland has lost. Uh, no, I don't know lost again. Yeah. You know, we have the competitive, but, but the rest of the yeah. world is moving very very fast. Mm -hmm. And so, again, that's why we have digital Switzerland. That's why, the, you know, the, the government and 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 you know and, and all the parties. And I should say the governments, right? Because there's the federal, the cantonal, uh, and, and of course the municipal. So I, I think there is a sense of of energy. It's just that in Switzerland, it's a sense of quieter energy. You know, it's not as effervescent uh, and vibrant, but I think Switzerland has amazing assets. Uh, and, and as I said, we are proud of our Swissness. Uh, and, and for us, coming from Switzerland, obviously with a global reach, but coming from Switzerland, I think uh, uh, people attribute to us, as I said, serious, honest, hardworking, uh, innovative, uh, high-end, so no, for us, our, our, our Swissness, we're very proud of our Swiss roots. Final question, it brings us back to the, the start of this discussion, uh, what, what makes a good leader? Uh, we had Josef Ackermann in this, in this program, uh, who, who has seen the world and who has seen businesses all over the world, and he says uh, he's, he's, he's interested in some philosophical questions about, about business and leadership. For example, one, why does someone have success in business? And the other, who is maybe sitting next to him in the university or in a business school, who's got the same education, who's got the same strength, the same talents, doesn't succeed. Sure. Why is that? This is not just an issue, by the way, in business. You, you may have children. You, know, you look at your children. You look at the other, other parents' children. And, and you say to yourself, you know, why them? Why me? Why why which them? one why will they succeed? Yeah. By the way, living in Asia, this is a question you face, huh? because in Asia, it's not like one building with uh, 200 people. It's you pass, and there's like 100,000 people in this neighborhood. And you pass, again, you know, professor or something, you're in a nice car, and you look around, and you do ask yourself, why me? So, so um, uh, multifaceted. And but is there, one, is there one answer to this? Probably hey, not. If there was a pill, I would have packaged it already, and I would be selling it, all right? <laughs> so, so, no, there's not one answer. Uh, there is not one answer. Steve Jobs was a very successful man, most of the time, but not all of the time. Steve Jobs ended up being unlucky, right? Uh, but before that, he ended up being lucky. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why <coughs> Apple is what it is today is because internet developed. Steve Jobs had not thought of the internet. But he had thought of a vision where the user would make decisions. And the user would drive the use of technology. Without internet, that doesn't happen. So again, you have to be visionary. You have to be driven. But there is a fine line between having a vision and having visions. And there is a fine line between being driven and you know, being overly persistent and being stubborn. And even a guy like Steve Jobs crossed those lines. Sometimes he was too forward, and sometimes he was stubborn. And sometimes he was lucky, sometimes he was unlucky. There are so many aspects. Think of your own life, you know, the times where you could have turned left and you ended up turning right. So, so I'm, I'm going to say, thank God there is not one way of succeeding. Thank God also there are many different ways of succeeding. There are people who end up succeeding in business and we see their, life on the, we see their name in the newspaper. There's also a lot of everyday heroes who show up and every day create value for, them, for themselves, for their communities, for their families. Voilà. So I think you want to talk philosophy. I would say, let's talk what is success. Uh, and, and again, we do this with executives. We ask them, you know, how do you want to be remembered? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? I think those are really powerful questions. And then once, once you tell me how do you want to be remembered, we can discuss how can we help you given your current uh, programming and capabilities, how can we help you get closer to that? But you'd be surprised. We have people who come to programs and, and they come in and they say, I want to be CEO. And you work with them over a year. And after a year, they say, you know, I don't want to be CEO, actually. And I want to do this instead or that instead. And that, I think, is also fantastic success, finding your own place in the world and how you will make a contribution and a contribution that you will be proud of and that will make you happy. A final advice from an expert. Thank you very much, Jean-François. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having Thank me. You.